Uh, you are here joining us for this event on Reliving History, a retrospective on the Trident program. And of course, what we're really talking about is the long-standing nuclear cooperation that exists between now and historically between the United Kingdom and the United States. And we really have a wonderful opportunity to have a terrific conversation today. Um, we came together, as you may know, sponsoring this event is the project on nuclear issues here at CSIS. Pony, as we like to call it, uh, fondly. And for anyone here who's not aware, who may have come just because of the draw of our tremendous speakers tonight, Pony is a program that is designed to identify, encourage, recruit, and develop the next generation of, of nuclear experts. And uh, we are, in fact, having some programming together with colleagues from the UK over the next few days who are embarked on a similar endeavor of identifying those experts for the future. And while we thought, what better way to kick off this joint US-UK program, because uh, if you're sort of learning for the future, you need to learn from the past, right? And uh, so this is a great chance for us to do that. Now, we have a great lineup, and I'm not going to attempt to read the small print of all of their extended bios. Um, but uh, we are going to kind of span the time, and I'm going to turn at one point here to Frank Miller to help sort of orchestrate as we get into the details. So with that, I'm going to start off with Frank Miller, who served from January 2001 to March 2005 as Special Assistant to President George W. Bush and Senior Director for Defense Policy and Arms Control on the National Security Staff. At the White House, he was responsible for a wide range of presidential policy initiatives, including those related to nuclear deterrence policy, strategic arms reductions, national space policy, defense trade reform, landmines, and I'll stop, and a number of important things. His 31-year career in government, including many years in OSD, gave him lots of opportunity to mentor the next generation, many of whom are here in the room. So, what I think is important in the period of time that we're talking about is that Frank was in fact a newly assigned director of strategic forces policy in OSD policy. We also have Sir David Omond, and Sir David was the first UK security and intelligence coordinator responsible to the Prime Minister for the professional health of the intelligence community, national counterterrorism strategy, and homeland security. He served for seven years on the Joint Intelligence Committee, and he was Permanent Secretary of the Home Office from 1997 to 2000. Before that, he was Director of GCHQ. So he's had a long, tremendous career. But at the time we're discussing, he was in fact, and I thought this sounded very British, the Principal Private Secretary to the Secretary of Defense, and in that role was played an important role in the development of the Trident Program. Then again, from the US side, we have Walter Slocum, who is senior counsel in Kaplan and Drysdale's uh, office in Washington, DC. Uh, many of us know him as his time. He served in uh, the Department of Defense as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 1994 to 2001. In 2003, he was senior advisor for national defense in the coalition provisional authority in Iraq. At the time of the Trident negotiations that they'll be discussing, he was Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for ISA, International Security Affairs. Um, he also had apparently several other titles. I could list them. I think he moved around a number of times and filled in for various absent officials. So I think you can let you elaborate that as you, you go through. And last but certainly not least, we have Sir Kevin Tebbett who is a retired career civil servant who held numerous uh, senior posts in the defense, intelligence, and diplomatic fields. He was director of GCHQ in 1998. He was permanent under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Defense from 1998 to 2005. His career in the Ministry of Defense goes back to 1969. And we had some discussion because he's had such a long career over the time of, of uh, his involvement in, in this particular episode, he was head of the nuclear policy branch within the MOD, and also, I think importantly here, um, served as the assistant to the late Sir Michael Quinlan. So, really there really are no better people here to discuss. We really appreciate you coming to talk to us about this. Tell us what really happened. 
um, share a couple of insights, hopefully give us a little bit of the, of the skinny of what it was really like uh, back in the day, as we say. So with that, I'm going to turn to you, Frank, to kind of uh, take it from here. And uh, thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming. So we're not going to start this at the beginning because that takes us back too far. We're going to sort of pick it up a little bit in the middle. And um, in the uh, late, uh, late 1950s, the United Kingdom had an uh, independent nuclear uh, force which was um, uh, based on long-range bombers. And the force needed a long-range missile to create penetrativity. Um, the UK was, was, having gone through some domestic alternatives, had contracted with the Eisenhower administration to buy a long-range missile called the Skybolt. And the US decided to cancel the Skybolt. And uh, McNamara offered the British a, a weapon called the Hound Dog, which they rightly said they couldn't sell to their public as a, a Hound Dog missile. Fast forward a couple of months, President Kennedy and, and Prime Minister McNamara agree that the United States will sell the United Kingdom Polaris A3, A1 missiles, and the British will build a submarine, uh, four submarines to carry them. So if we go further into the 60s, and we're back about uh, 69, 70, the United States has gone through the Polaris A1, the Polaris A2, Polaris A3, and has moved on to the MIRVED Poseidon C3. The United Kingdom is still deploying the Polaris A3 and was facing a choice as to whether or not to go with the Poseidon C3 system or to stay with the A3, at which point Kevin picks us up. Well, thank you, Frank. Um, picture of a very young man, well, relatively young man, in his 20s uh, in the outer office of a very famous defense secretary called Lord Carrington, who subsequently became Secretary General of NATO, famous Lord Carrington who resigned over the Falklands affair. Lord Carrington comes out of his office and looks around the group of relatively unimportant junior secretaries and said, OK, we've taken a firm decision. Uh, we're going to proceed with uh, our own development. We're not going to go with the US. We're not going to go with Poseidon. We're going to have our own improvement program uh, uh, on what had been a joint program, which the US actually originally offered to the UK back in 1967. It was called Antelope, and it was improved in concept to a thing called Super Antelope. And in, yeah, in 1973, uh, after several iterations, the British government finally decided, this was the Conservative government under Edward Heath from 1970 to 74, finally decided to proceed with a UK program uh, to develop effectively Super Antelope. Uh, now, I knew nothing whatsoever about what this meant. I'd been a civil servant for three, four years. Uh, but he said, which of you is going to find me a British name for Super Antelope? Because I need a code name for it, a special British name, and I'm taking it to the Prime Minister at 5 o'clock today. So we all scurried around, and I picked up the telephone. And I telephoned the London Zoo. Uh, and I said, this is the Ministry of Defense. Now, in those days, people were very deferential. I can't tell you why I'm calling but I need you to tell me if there's any animal that's sort of like a super antelope, but is a bit more British. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they said, yes, sir, we'll call you back. And an hour later, the telephone rang. And they said, we've been around all the keepers of all the various species and all of that. And there is an animal that we found. Um, it's uh, South African, actually, not British, but you know, the empire was still fairly recent to most people's memory. And it's called Chevaline, which is a rather large antelope. So I thought, well, you know, it sounds a bit like a, a sort of French horse thing. But nevertheless, it didn't sound too bad. So I wrote this a little note to Carrington, which unfortunately I don't have, um, saying, how about Chevaline? He came out and said, well, yeah, I quite like the sound of it, took it to the prime minister, and that's how Chevaline began. So I actually was responsible. For me. I knew nothing whatsoever about the issues in those days things were extremely secret. I then, of course, uh, started to find out about this thing that accidentally I'd been responsible for naming. And so uh, that began what became a 40-year interest and commitment and various jobs I did, involvement with uh, the British uh, and 
NATO nuclear deterrence. Um, now, Chevaline, as you, uh, it's worth just providing a bit of background on this because uh, it illustrates quite a lot of principles which continue to run through the totality of the sort of SSBN world, including the Trident missile. Um, I mean, as you probably know, or you may not know, Chevaline uh, was a change to the Polaris A3 uh, missile. Uh, it became called A3T. It involved uh, hardening. It had a new front end, a new bus, which was hardened. Uh, everything was against the new, of course, uh, ABM shield, which uh, Russia was deploying. To start with, people didn't know how much there would be. In the end, they ended up with 100 missiles around Moscow. It was designed to withstand the effects of close explosions from the ABM shield, the Galosh missiles. Uh, there were three warheads originally in the Polaris uh, front end. Uh, this was reduced to two, and instead of the third uh, warhead, uh, a lot of decoys were put in. Uh, the numbers actually varied and changed over time, uh, together with a lot of chaff to actually blind and defeat the uh, Russian system. It wasn't straightforward. Uh, there were other options. The British Navy still wanted to take Poseidon and uh, argued for it for quite a long time. Uh, but in the end, this development went forward. Um, just to give you an indication of how these things were, when that program was first thought of, back in around 1967, the estimate was it might cost around 30 million to adapt the missiles to do this task. When uh, I was involved in 1973, the cost was estimated at around 250. By 1975-76, it was 400 million. I then took another job, which actually was the nuclear planning job, and during that period, uh, for the final development of, of, of the project, it went up to a billion. I still, I think, probably hold the record of at one stage or another uh, having a uh, 40 times increase in cost, 40 times uh, above the original estimate. Fortunately, in those days, different from today, it was keep, kept completely secret. The cost of this was hidden in various parts of the budget, so we never went public with the costs throughout that whole period. Indeed, the whole project was secret, not least because the Conservative government gave way to a Labour government, uh, and the Labour government had much more difficulty with these issues than did the Conservatives. It illustrates another continuing theme in this story, which is Britain as the most reluctant of the nuclear powers, always finding it hard to do it. And it was then, in 1975, that the Wilson government uh, in, enunciated the principle that we wouldn't try to increase our nuclear capability. All we would ever do would main maintain the effectiveness of the minimum deterrent as necessary for uh, the independent uh, defense of supreme national interest and as a second center of decision making for uh, NATO to enhance NATO deterrence. But it was always a minimum deterrent. And so it was always argued simply keeping where we were before, before the Russians put up the ABM shield. So a rather important principle which has run through the whole of the uh, British history. Anyway, there we went forward. In 1975, I'd left by that stage. I was doing something else. But none of us realized at the time that the British Treasury almost sought to push the UK out of the nuclear game. But that was the point when the costs were about 400 million. And it was thought to be by the Treasury a time of great economic austerity in Britain. It was just too expensive to continue. And that was overridden and overruled, and the thing went forward. A little later, I was actually present at a meeting between the then Defence Secretary uh, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a very powerful man called Dennis Healy, uh, uh, when they were about to have another cabinet meeting about this program. And Healy said, uh, I'm going to have to oppose you over this because it's too expensive in relation to everything else. But I need you to know, Defence Secretary, that if you look like losing in Cabinet, then I'll have to support you. <laughs> <laughs> so they had this pantomime of this play which went, which went through. Anyway, another, as it were, dimension, which is always worth recording in these things, is just how long it takes to, to develop a nuclear system. I mean, this was a program originally began by the United States in the mid-60s, before they decided to go to Poseidon. Picked up by the UK 
with some bits of development in the late 60s, finally committed as a separate program in 1972. Uh, that missile development was only fielded finally in 1982. And it, it was fielded through the period 82 to 87, by the time all four boats had got the Chevalier warheads, which of course by that stage was well enough to ensure that we could continue to maintain our deterrent criterion. Uh, it still makes me wince to think it was called the Moscow criterion, but these days it's so obvious to everybody, I don't know why we bothered to be quite so secretive, but it was incredibly secret at the time. Um, so those long lead times, remember we were deploying this system at the same time as we'd already decided to go for the Trident system. Uh, that's just how this business is. So you who are young now can expect in 40 years' time, I sort of hope, well, of course, we all hope we won't have nuclear weapons, but let's be realistic, you will still be seeing these issues uh, working through. Um, another aspect of this, obviously, is it demonstrates the closeness of the US-UK relationship. But it is interesting that the UK decided to go it alone on this particular development. Um, it illustrates a number of things. Firstly, relationships were never always totally easy between the US and the UK. There were people in Washington who did not want the UK, for example, to have Poseidon. Um, the British Navy would always have preferred to have had Poseidon. But in going down this particular route, um, it ensured that certain skills, scientific, engineering, and technical skills were preserved in the UK which may not have been preserved had we simply adopted the Poseidon system and gone exactly with the United States. It actually was a tremendous achievement. Um, the engineering got so good, although it took an awful lot of time to get it that way, that effectively it had become a merged system in the sense that although the target was still hit pretty close on by the two real warheads, they left the bus in this way and did effectively an independent route, evading any of the, before they joined again. And it, they got so good at that, it effectively was working as a MERV system, had they chosen to spread it differently. Um, so we are really quite proud of it in the end. And of course, it still has a value in the modern world, because the technology which the UK developed in that period is very similar to the technology that an emerging nuclear power would develop before it actually had a full nerfed capability. And you can work out for yourselves how useful that sort of thing is if you're trying to work out fairly low level BMD, BMD technology. Have I gone on long enough? I can go on forever on no, that subject, but that's, I think right. that's probably that's given right. you a bit of an insight. So, um, so Kevin's <coughs> taken us up to, to the, the end of the Ford administration when it's become increasingly obvious to the United Kingdom that however good Chevalier is, it's too damn expensive to continue into the future. Enter the Carter administration. Thanks very much. I, I can't resist saying that Chevalier, which was essentially a pen aid system, is the answer to the Ted Postals of the world who say it's child's play to build a good penetrator for an ABM system. Uh, I, I don't mean to be cynical, but I observe that this wonderful system was kept in in the force for only five years. Anyway, my job is to talk about the decision on this matter during the Carter years. I think it's fair to say that when President Carter was elected, the British were already moving toward the idea of ad uh, adopting a, the uh, Trident One system. And when the new administration came to power, I think they were very wary. Um, President Carter was deeply devoted to arms control. He cared a lot about non-proliferation. He wanted to reduce the role of nuclear weapons. And there was an issue in the then ongoing SALT II talks about what was called non-circumvention, which, which was our jargon, at least, for the Soviet position, which in its baldest form, although they didn't stick to this for very long, said that if the American force was A and the British force was B and the French force was C, then the value of the Soviet force would be the sum of those three numbers. That anything that had to do with assistance to the British and French 
uh, particularly the British who were regarded by the Soviets as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Department of Defense, uh, was a problem in the negotiations. Moreover, the fact that it would involve doing something, uh, MIRVs were pretty controversial anyway, although the di from the United States point of view, the decision was long in the past. But there had been a lot of controversy about whether to, de to deploy them, and there was some sense that maybe this wasn't a good idea to um, metastasize the illness by getting the British one. And I think it is fair to say that there was the unhappy memory of the Skybolt fiasco uh, the, on the British side, that a new, a new administration might screw them again. So the question was, would the United States be open to a British request to apply the Trident I on a basis comparable to the original Polaris deal? And the British, as I understood it, need to know because they were still in the process of analysis of what, what they wanted to do and there were various options open. And while they weren't committed, they were looking at the various options and they needed to know if this was a realistic one that they should be thinking about. So the British set about trying to find out and I, can't, I confess I can't remember the exact date, <clears throat> but my recollection is that it was very early in President Clinton's administration, so it would have been something like uh, late winter, early spring of 1977, and I received a visit from Michael Quinlan. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that one of the things that makes me sad about this whole business is he's the person who should be here to talk about this. Then you could dispense with all the rest of us and he could simply tell you. He also could explain everything worth knowing about nuclear weapons, at any rate. It was the first time I'd met him and it was the beginning of a long association and friendship and I miss him greatly. I was accompanied by Admiral Bob Wertheim who was in charge of the US sea-based submarine missile program. Um, and Quinlan outlined the issue and we undertook to get an answer. I can't honestly remember whether we undertook to get an answer or we'd already worked out what the answer would be. And I told him with Admiral Wertheim's support that while there could be no commitment on details until the British made a request and the terms were worked out, the new leadership of the Defense Department and I believed the rest of the administration put a high value on the US-UK alliance on the role of the British force and <clears throat> regarded cooperation as, on missiles as a good thing and that in principle the option would be open. Uh, I have to say I believe from the expression on his face that the, Michael Quinlan was visibly relieved at this news. Uh, the small, uh, a small anecdote is that Admiral Wertheim at some point addressed him as Sir Michael, knowing that all British civil servants eventually get knighted. And Michael's answer was characteristic. He said, oh, that will be several years in the future. <laughs> um, so as I remember, although there were certainly people who were dubious about doing it, there was not a great deal, it, it was not a big deal. It was not a big deal. Uh, and although there may have been reluctance or reservations at state and uh, the state at, and, and the NSC, uh, it was not a big deal. And I honestly don't remember how the process worked that authorized this. So the British took, took some time in the complete analysis and they looked at and rejected a long catalog. Uh, Michael was a Jesuit, a Jesuit educated man, and he had this extraordinarily logical mind. So essentially they had sat down and thought through every conceivable <coughs> answer. They looked at, if any of you know Dick Garwin, he in those days was peddling the idea of very small diesel submarines, not nuclear, each of which would carry only a couple of missiles, thereby devaluing the target. And so the whole range was considered. And they finally, in July of 1980, announced their choice that they had settled on the tried and won is the right answer. And it was, I can't say it was really kept secret, but it was all wired so that on the same day the British 
announced their decision on what they wanted, they also announced the agreement, or we announced the agreement uh, on the details. Um, on, on, the, on the agreement that's to sell, but we then started what I would call as a lawyer a, a process of due diligence. That is, you know you want to do this, you'll work very hard to make it happen, but you've got to ask hard questions, you've got to be sure you've turned over all the rocks. It was reasonably swift. One of the issues was how would the British explain the decision in the context of the SALT negotiations, where, as I said, non-circumvention was a major issue. Uh, the British have a, had a formula which explained exactly how it was consistent with the agreement, which had, which had by that time been signed, so it was not a speculation as to what the agreement would say. And then recurring to this point that um, Kevin made, Sir Kevin, that um, about the size of the British force, it was an argument which I always thought was quite a credible one, that if you went back to when the British got A3s first, it was about 10% of the American force. And the effect of this, given the increase in the size of the American force, would bring it back to be about 10% of the American force. And that was, at least to gather, a sufficient explanation that it wasn't increasing the capability, it was maintaining it. Um, the other, the, the probably, well, I'll come to price in a minute. Uh, in businesses like this, gentlemen do discuss money. Um, but the United States was concerned about an issue, which I think had been a, an issue in Britain as well, that money spent on the independent nuclear deterrent was almost by definition <coughs> money not spent on conventional forces. And this was at a time when the, the United States the administration was working very hard to try to persuade the Allies to increase their defense spending on conventional forces. So that was an issue. Um, let me turn, I'll come back to that, but let me turn to the issue of price. Under the Polaris Agreement, the British, of course, paid all the incremental costs, all the extra costs of having the 100 or so missiles they were going to buy. The major stumbling block was whether, or rather how much, the British would have to contri contribute to the R&D costs. That is, the, the hawks in the United States argued that the British were buying into a system which the American taxpayer had paid a lot of money to develop. It's always the case that the my, my example always was there was a lot of criticism of the B-1 <clears throat> on the grounds that it cost $100 million or whatever it was a copy, and that was too much. And then we buy two, then it cost $50 million a copy. And so this, this argument about, increment, about how you spread the overhead cost was quite a, a strong one. Uh, and the United States law required, as far as I know still requires, <clears throat> that any, on any foreign military sales, and this was a big, but it went, went, went through the regular foreign military sales procedure, we had to recoup the R the, uh, an appropriate proportionate share of the R&D costs. So there was a long and rather heated negotiation. <clears throat> the United States made the argument I was just outlining that we had saved the British a huge amount of money on developing their own system, which the French had had to do. And so a full recoupment was only fair. The British argument <clears throat> was that we'd already paid for the R&D and there was no increase in the American costs. And so we, the, and the British program was economically very good for the British. And they were, believe me, it's a beautiful car. It has undercoating and windows work and it has places, it has lots of places to hold cups and you should willingly pay the, the uh, R&D costs. What we eventually ended up with, which is probably predictable, is the Polaris Agreement, where the British simply paid a 5% overhead charge on the purchase without regard to what the R&D cost had been. However, in order to sweeten the deal, the, um, it was also agreed that the British would provide the manning for a British air defense system called Rapier, which was going to be deployed around 
American air bases in Britain, and we all solemnly maintain that this would represent the British investing the cost saving on the system into rape into into rapier. Um, let's see. So the formal decision then was announced in July of 1980, and there was in in a kind of monument to the great pyramid of being, there was a letter, an exchange of letters between the president and the prime minister, an exchange of letters between the uh, secretary of defense and the minister for defense, and then an exchange of letters between me and Michael. But for some reason that I forget having to do with, I think we had to move some Pentagon stationery out to the British embassy to finally type up the agreement. And we were having lunch and so we, it came in a car and the two of us went down and we signed it on the, showing that we are two countries, uh, we are two countries separated by a common language. It was never agreed whether we signed it on the hood of the car or the boot of the car, but it was signed on the car. Um, so the sequel then, uh, is what is I think the next topic, was that even as this was all going on, uh, the United States was moving to replace a successor, tri uh, 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 a successor trident, uh, moving to, a, to the D5 as a successor trident. And there was no secret that the United States was looking at this, and indeed waiting for the D5 had been one of the options considered and reported in the public document, because by this time the British really were setting an extraordinarily good example of openness about basic decisions, partly I think because Michael was, who was, first of all, if you had Michael Quinlan to write the rationale, he could sell icebergs to Eskimos. But the second was that it was fair that the habit is a part of a democratic system. Um, but anyway, the, the, uh, the, the decision in, in the, by the British in 1980 was that they didn't want to buy into a system that was not definite that the Americans would in fact deploy at all, and that then takes us to the Oh, thank you, Walt. Um, I'm going to pick up the story. Uh, I mean, I joined the uh, uh, Defense Private Office working for the uh, Secretary <coughs> of Defense in 1979, and by then, as Walt has said, the uh, uh, Trident One decision was proceeding. And by the middle of 1980, it had indeed been taken and, and announced. The uh, consideration of, of, of uh, Trident 1, when that was looked at, did consider D5. Uh, but there were, first of all, it w was obviously going to be, if it ever appeared, a much more powerful system. So did the United Kingdom really need that, 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 that system? It w would be more expensive. And crucially, would the United States actually go ahead with D5? Congress had zero funded uh, D5 in 75 and 76. Yes, it was proceeding, but where would it, uh, when would a decision finally uh, be taken? In fact, D in the archive, I found um, uh, Michael Quinlan, who's already been referred to, uh, recording a conversation with one Walt Slocum in May of 1980. So I copied it out of the archives. And it, I'll just read you a couple of sentences. Over lunch a fortnight ago, I mentioned informally to Mr. Walter Slocum of US DOD the question of how long C4, the Trident One, was likely to remain operational in US service. I didn't push the matter, but he volunteered to get a more considered view uh, and which reflected discussions he was going to have with Admiral Wertheim. He then, uh, Michael then records that Walt came back to him and said it was in advanced pre-engineering development and a decision was probably not going to be taken uh, before uh, fiscal year 83. Now, the UK by then was already beginning to spend, you know, really think uh, how it was going to uh, manage Trident 1. And 
to understand why it was that within a year UK had actually switched horses, um, you have to come back to what Kevin was saying, which was the hangover of the Chevalin program. Uh, Professor Ron Mason, who was the chief scientist, who was the independent chair of the equipment committee that uh, advised on, on choices of major equipment, um, wrote that the, the Chevalin experience, quotes, left an indelible mark on my own mind. And that is the tremendous resources you have to call into play if you develop a major strategic program unilaterally. Uh, I think that probably consciously rather than subconsciously played a very considerable part in my approach to strategic successor systems. My feeling was that only opportunities for commonality with the United States uh, had to be seen through before you would again face up to the prospect of being essentially on your own with your own system. And what Walt's advice uh, to Michael Quinlan um, revealed was there was a worst case, which is that uh, the US would have introduced D5, only the old Poseidon, uh, the um, uh, sea would be left in a small number of Poseidon boats. Uh, the UK could find itself once again on its own with its uh, Trident One force and rapidly running out of commonality with the United States. And this, this consideration um, within a year uh, had emerged into a hardening of view that actually it was worth the cost, the quite considerable additional cost of going for D5 uh, and actually scrapping uh, the intention to buy Trident 1 and switching uh, to Trident um, 2. Um, I assume it was the, Frank will correct me and Walt will correct me, but the arrival of President Reagan in 1981 clearly had a quite electric effect on strategic systems thinking. And in other areas. And uh, the faster pace. So it became increasingly clear inside the Ministry of Defense in London that D5 was going to end up as a very significant part of the American arsenal. Uh, and by the spring of 1981, the Royal Navy had pretty well made up its mind that this was the, the road to go. Uh, very influential in that was the fact that you'd taken the decision in the United States to have a, uh, an East Coast base, King's Bay, Georgia, uh, as well as Bangor in Washington State. And so from a UK point of view, that opened the prospect of further <coughs> US-UK cooperation, perhaps having a single uh, missile processing line. Um, and that was, that was clearly uh, uh, very much in people's minds. But at the point I'm talking about in uh, 1981, the uh, UK had already started to spend quite significant sums of money on C4. So the question was, how long could the UK keep spending that money, waiting for the United States finally to make a decision on, uh, on D5? And the, the first thing that had to be decided was the center section of the boat. And uh, if we chose to put in the uh, Ohio section, that would keep the option open. So that was the first thing that then got uh, decided. But it still looked as if the US decision might be some way off. And here, personal relationships, I think, played a part. Because by then, John Knott was Defense Secretary. I was his principal private secretary. And he got on extremely well with Cap Weinberger. And he invited Weinberger to London in August 1981, and not got cabinet approval to have a private conversation <coughs> with, 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 with Weinberger and say, we're in a bind, we're spending money on this system, we think we might want to switch, uh, we can't responsibly do that until we know that you are going to take a decision. 
and uh, Weinberger took that back to Washington and uh, again from the archive uh, he wrote a letter to Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister saying, Dear Prime Minister, as a result of my meeting with John Knott, I understand that an early decision by the US on the D-5 missile would greatly assist the budgetary planning of Her Majesty's government. It would more than do that. It was, uh, so he then went on to say, I'm pleased to inform you that President Reagan has authorized me to advise you now in advance of a public announcement that we will use the D-5 missile in our Trident boats and we will make that missile available to you should you desire to buy it. And um, Cap ended up, I'm especially pleased that the cooperation of our governments in strengthening our mutual security is again reflected in this decision. So on the back of that letter of comfort, you might say, um, John Knott took the case for D5 uh, and switching from C4 uh, to the cabinet committee uh, uh, that Margaret Thatcher um, chaired. The uh, permanent secretary, the senior civil servant in the Ministry of Defense at this point intervened um, and said, this is going to be very expensive. Uh, we were facing a large uh, expenditure on remotoring the Polaris uh, A3T uh, rockets. Uh, we had final expenditure on Chevaline, which was about to enter service. This is why we had to come out with the figure, because with these big decisions coming up, we couldn't hide the fact that a billion uh, pounds have actually been spent on Chevaline. So and there was a the question of how many uh, missile tubes should we put in the center section. We only needed 12, technically but 16 would provide flexibility should the uh, Soviet Union extend its ABM and uh, system. And in the end, uh, John Knott decided he, he, we, we'd go for C5, uh, D5 uh, with 16, 16 tubes and the Ohio um, center section. The cabinet minutes um, of the British, in British cabinet minutes are very unrevealing. But the cabinet secretary who takes the minutes keeps a notebook. And these notebooks end up in the National Archives. So you can reverse engineer this and work out what, which ministers were saying what. And it's quite interesting, in that final discussion, Margaret Thatcher was expressing concern over the cost, which was a great deal more than C4 would have been. Uh, she was also very worried about Soviet ABM development. The Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, uh, thought that you could save money by only having 12 to 2016, <coughs> so he and the Prime Minister were slightly at, at odds. Um, the Foreign Secretary, Carrington, was worried about arms control and how you would justify uh, the greater capability. And he actually thought C4 from an arms control point of view, would be easier to sell to public opinion. And the only one who really questioned whether we could afford to stay in this game was the Deputy Prime Minister, William Whitelaw. Uh, and the, uh, they spent a whole day debating this, which is quite unusual. Uh, uh, and they were briefed in depth by the Chief of Defense and by the Chief Scientist, uh, did they really understand the technical issues? I'm not sure they necessarily did. But they understood, as say, the Chevaline logic, that actually if you didn't do this, there was a substantial risk that we would have ended up, as say, running a system that you had already moved on from. So in the end, um, they, uh, they took it to the, to the, to the cabinet and authorized negotiations with Walt to take... Uh, Not with me, with Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl, rather. There uh, is a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, Robert Wade Geary, a senior official in the diplomat, uh, led a team to, on two trips to Washington, and they finally, uh, finally did a deal. The uh, a little anecdote here, uh, John Knott, who was the defense secretary, 
had been trade minister when the C4 decision came to cabinet. And it had always been the tradition in that the prime minister simply told the cabinet what the decision was on a nuclear issue. He didn't have this cabinet as a whole. And John Ott objected to the, quite strongly to this. So he confronted Margaret Thatcher and is a former banker. And this wasn't you, the way you made major investment decisions. You know, you had figuring and numbers and so on. And so when it came to the uh, D5 decision, John very unusually offered every member of the cabinet a briefing on the Trident decision. And every member of the cabinet took it. And so for the first time, this was a collective decision in which the members of the cabinet understood exactly uh, what, they were, what they were agreeing to. And then, as I, uh, I said, the uh, 11th of March, the, uh, there was an exchange of letters between the government uh, an open government document written by Michael Quinlan was, was published, and we went for uh, D5. Um, a couple of weeks later, we were all in Colorado Springs at the Nuclear Planning Group, trying to persuade the rest of the alliance that this was a good move, and to get something in the communique to actually acknowledge this. Uh, some of our allies were less than enthusiastic about doing that, but we finally got the following sentence. They noted the continuing build-up by the Soviet Union of its strategic forces and, in that connection, supported the determination of the United States and the United Kingdom to ensure deterrent capabilities of their strategic nuclear forces, which are of fundamental importance to the Alliance's strategy. So we, we felt we'd done justice uh, uh, at that um, point. There was then a debate in the House of Commons, uh, which the government won, and the rest, as they say, is history. Just one final coda. The, uh, on the 31st of March, which is very shortly after that uh, debate in the House of Commons, in fact, the following week from the debate in the House of Commons, uh, John Knott and I were in his room in the House of Commons uh, working on another speech to justify the public speech, justify the decision to buy uh, D5, when uh, a member of the defense intelligence staff brought a piece of signals intelligence down, uh, which pointed out that, well, which demonstrated that the Argentine government was putting itself in a position to be able to invade the Falkland Islands and they had conducted a covert beach reconnaissance. So we uh, took with this piece of intelligence, ran along the corridor, and burst in on Margaret Thatcher, who was in her office, and showed her this. In her memoirs, um, Mrs. Thatcher describes this as the worst day of her life. Um, uh, her first reaction was, you know, this is very serious. Uh, so we nodded and said, yes. This is yes, very Prime serious. Minister. Yes, Prime Minister, this is very serious. And her first reaction was, I must speak to the President. That was her first instinct, because only the President of the United States can persuade the Argentine government what a mistake it would be. Uh, uh, President Galtieri would not receive, wouldn't take Reagan's call, so, uh, which shows just how <laughs> the Argentine junta knew perfectly well that they would simply not be allowed to continue with it. So they just simply refused to take any communication from the United States and the invasion took place on the 2nd of April, which completely wiped off the public debate any further discussion <coughs> of Trident D5. Uh, Margaret Thatcher's position after the war was over uh, was unassailable. Uh, and, as it were, there were no voices thereafter really raised against uh, D5, which shows that sometimes history has a funny way of working things out. <laughs> I'll just say that the reason, of course, that this was particularly convenient is because, remember, at this very point when these big, big decisions were being taken, this hugely expensive one billion Chevrolet program, the largest defense program ever to be 
uh, uh, conceived and carried forward without being disclosed to the public in history. The lips was still only just coming to fruition. There was in that same year, 1982, an extremely critical public accounts committee report on the whole Chevalier history. Um, and the first Chevalier missiles were only being deployed in uh, our Polaris boats in 1982 and were fielded across a period from 82 to 87, again illustrating this very long lead time necessary for these things. But had, I suspect, uh, the Falklands not intervened, this whole problem of all of this nuclear issue all at once would be much harder to manage. Well, I think one thing you should take away from all of this is is the importance of personal relationships throughout throughout this process and continuing. And, and indeed, mm. um, uh, the four of us have worked this issue in one configuration or another for for, for thirty odd years. Um, I came I came to the game late in. in um, October of 1981, I was a newly minted office director, as, uh, as Rebecca said. And, and I had my hands full trying to deal with the, with the declaratory policy of the United States, which was inherited from the Republican National Committee. And we were trying to bring this back to the, uh, to the, to the mainstream, which we succeeded in doing eventually. Um, and, and in December of, of 81, I believe, a British delegation headed by Robert Wade Gary came to Washington to discuss the um, sale of, of Triton II. And uh, I didn't attend the meeting. I was too busy doing US things. There was a member of the Pentagon staff at the meeting, though, who was the UK desk officer. And, you know, after 30 years, I, I think I just, his name just popped into my head, and I won't mention it. But this gentleman had suffered through the negotiations of Trident One, and he'd had it up to here with the damn Brits just taking us to the cleaners. And so during this meeting with Robert Wade Gary, he stood up and he said, you are going to pay for every cent of R&D recruitment that we can charge you. And the meeting ended. I mean, Gary thanked him, folded up the briefcases and left. It so happened, however, that that European policy office worked for Richard Pearl, as did I. And so shortly thereafter, um, a, a, a very close hold U.S. government working group was formed up in 1982. And the three principals were, were Bud McFarlane, who was the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, Rick Bird, who was Assistant Secretary for PM, and Pearl. And, and at the end of the day, three of us were told to get this thing done. Um, it was Commander Denny Blair of the NSC staff. It was Major John Gordon of the Air Force assigned to the State Department and moi um, with, with some help from Dov, Dov Zakheim. And there, there was no question but that we were going to find a way to help the UK. And indeed it was, it was Pearl's view and, and, and my view that given what was going on in the world, particularly with the Soviet Union, that, that maintaining a second center of nuclear decision making was, was vital to the security <coughs> of the West. And so we were going to make certain that, that the United Kingdom could, could affordably buy the D5 system. Um, so we went for the lowest possible R&D recruitment. We kept the, um, the, the offset for the RAPER units that were defend, providing air defense for US air bases in Germany. And um, we also, uh, we thought, uh, you're, not too, you're never too old to learn something, that we, we thought that um, we had convinced the UK to keep in service um, two amphibious warfare ships, the uh, Fearless and the Intrepid, um, which the British government had indicated it was going to retire. Um, as I was looking for, for documents to print out to just bring along today, I found um, a, a memo written in um, early 1982 by Robert Wade Gary reporting to the Prime Minister uh, what, what, was the, um, what had been accomplished at this second and successful meeting in the Pentagon. And I found, to my great surprise this afternoon, the following. Um, he talks about the successful uh, recruitment of R&D charges uh, agreement, and he says, the lever which in the end secured these concessions was our decision, which the Americans do not know we had already taken on other grounds. 
to reprieve the naval um, assault ships, fearless and intrepid. So, you know, there you go. It turned out, actually, that, 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 that in, in, in an odd way, this, this played a, a, a factor months later because Fearless and Intrepid did play a significant role in the recapture of the Falklands. So, I mean, it, it, it's all very interesting the way it comes around. So, so we came to a, a, um, a very good outcome for both countries. The letters were exchanged in, in March of 1982, just as David indicated, and you know, the, the Gordon Miller Blair trio wrote the US letters. Um, the signatories never write those letters. The United Kingdom also asked, John Knott asked Cap Weinberger to provide an assurance which the US did, and this has caused some small problem in the relationship in those early years where the, the Weinberger said that the United States, at the British urging, would permit United Kingdom manufacturers to compete on the same terms as US firms for subcontracts for the Trident II D5 weapon system components for the program as a whole. Now, we, we put that in because we were asked to do so, but the truth of the matter was the D5 had basically been, been designed, the contracts had been let. I mean, there was, there was no room for the UK to to compete because the contracts ha had been done. That was the only, the only wrinkle. Um, shortly after all of this, I think it was Sir Frank Cooper, who was permanent secretary, came to Washington and, and we had a very, uh, it turns out to be a critical meeting with, with Pearl and me where, where um, Sir Frank said, I understand that the D5 can carry 12 RVs, 12 reentry vehicles, 12, 12 words. That's the configuration we need in order to be assured that we can penetrate the Moscow ABM. And we said, that you shall have. That's what you contracted to buy, and, and, and that you shall have. If you fast forward, I'm going to get ahead of myself in the story, but it's, this is probably the time to tell it. As the US administration began gearing up for negotiating the START Treaty with the Soviet Union, the, and, and it became clear that we, the US, were only going to deploy D5 with the maximum of eight warheads. The arms controllers, including the arms controllers in OSD policy, came forward and said, that's it, you gotta tell the British, no, no can have, you get eight warheads. And, and Pearl and I just swatted that away. We said, look, we made a solemn commitment that, that the UK was gonna have a 12 position um, uh, bus, and, and that's what we are going to do. And in fact, in September of 1987, um, the Navy did test 10 RVs off the system to ensure that we could test 12 RVs uh, or that the British could test, test 12 RVs. And eventually we, we worked out a verification scheme whereby the US deployed eight and the UK system was, was independent. But it was one of those little quirks where, where the arms controllers almost um, tried to, to, to kneecap uh, the United Kingdom. As we proceeded through the, the, the um, early to mid 80s, we, the United States government, we, the Department of Defense, we OSD policy, uh, worked very hard to ensure that when cost issues arose, um, we did things that could be of, of um, minimum cost and impact to the UK. So one of, the, one of the early questions was, would the UK be required to build a storage facility in Scotland for the, the three submarine boatloads of, of D5s that they were going to buy, plus a number of spares? Um, as David had foreshadowed, the fact that we were building a Trident base on the US East Coast at Kings Bay, Georgia, offered another opportunity and so um, we, we agreed that we would find a way to, to um, store the UK missiles on US soil. And, and for months, I went round and round with the Navy as we were scratching our heads about how are we going to do this? And were we going to build a fence inside a fence and have a, a lone a Royal Marine and a Union Jack? And you know, these are going to be the British missiles. At the end of the day, uh, we had a unique solution emerge, which was that the UK would not buy its missiles outright, but in fact it would obtain leasing rights 
to the number of missiles that the United Kingdom had agreed to buy. And this, this is actually hugely significant because what it meant was all the Trident piece parts were stored at King's Bay. A US submarine would take 24 Tridents and take them to sea. It would come back after, after some set number of patrols, the missiles would be broken down and go into various storage sets. When the UK first Vanguard submarine came to outload, it came to King's Bay and it took 16 Trident missiles, which were made up of the various piece parts that were available at the time. But what that meant was that the United Kingdom was fully vested in the flight test history of the Trident II D-5 missile. And so every Trident II D-5 test was available as, as a UK basis of proof that the system would work. Um, it also had the advantage, of course, from your point of view, that you have a larger stock of missiles. Therefore, the total data available yeah. is larger than it would otherwise yeah. have been. I should say, for any of you who don't follow this closely, the warheads, of course, were mated with a missile in Scotland. And, and, and in fact, this was an area we were not able to help with, but the, when the UK built a warhead storage facility in Coolport, Scotland, that was at one point the largest public works project in all of Europe. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, effort. Uh, a second thing that we did is, is we contributed to the best of our ability to the program to, to build new motors for the A3T yeah. missile. Um, uh, we offered the, 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 the A3T was getting old and the A3T was suffering from what Don Rumsfeld later made the famous unknown unknowns. There were problems, and they, those problems could not be predicted. And while the US Navy offered to, to, to give the Royal Navy um, our entire stock of A3s, it didn't make any difference because those A3s suffered from the same unknown unknown problems. Given that the A3T was manufactured in the 1960s, and we were now in the 1980s, we working through the Navy actually had to pull people out of retirement, 70 year old engineers, to try to recreate the A3T engines. And this was an enormously expensive project which reinforced in the minds of anybody in London that the UK should not ever be put in the position of being the singular deployer of a strategic system. Um, Another thing that we did, which, which again, again began, as, as with many of these things, uh, began for other reasons, but, but which was providential, was that the targeting cell which NATO had at SHAPE headquarters in Mons was being reduced because uh, some of our allies didn't want to supply the, the manpower, didn't want the cost of the billets uh, at, at, at the targeting cell. And at the same time, because the D5's capacity and capabilities were, were very sensitive, we were not inclined to, to share the D5 targeting model with all of our allies. So we worked out an agreement whereby the, the shape targeting cell in Mons was shut down. And we took a UK liaison officer, created the, the notion of a UK liaison officer who was the shape targeting officer in Omaha. So the coordination of US and UK forces in a shape plan, which I, I will point out to those who aren't familiar with, was independent from the UK and the US national plans, also created an opportunity whereby UK officers could learn how to transition from the world of the Chevalier, which despite its MERV mm -hmm. potential was really a single Oh, yes, tool RV target. system to a system where they were going to be targeting 12 RVs on a single missile with 16 missiles on a boat. So that again offered us an opportunity to provide basically a training course for Royal Navy officers and targeteers so that when Vanguard entered into service, the, the UK was, was, was ready to do that. Um, I guess the last point I'd, 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 I'd make in, in all of this is to revert to, to, to what Walt was saying about, about non-circumvention. Um, and again, we're back, we're back to personal 
relationships. But as we were getting towards the end of the START treaty, and our negotiator for that treaty is sitting in the back of the room, uh, Linton Brooks, um, we needed to come up with a statement uh, to say to the Russians, um, I'm sorry, the British system is the British system. And if you see a British test with 12 warheads, that's, they've all got Union Jacks on them. That, that's not an American system. It's not a violation of START. Um, so we, we had to come up with a statement for, for Linton to make to the Russians uh, in the treaty uh, process. Um, again, we, we, we went back to 1982. And in Cap Weinberger's letter to John Knott, I guess I had written, the United States attaches great importance to the maintenance by the United Kingdom government of an independent nuclear deterrent. Well, we seized on that language. And so what we did, Linton and I first worked it out, and then um, in one of those things that you're not supposed to do, but we did, I mean, I gave the language to Kevin. And before we ever showed it to the State Department, um, we had worked out the language. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting if you read what, what Linton supplied to the Soviets. Um, among other things, it says the United States attaches great importance to the role played by the United Kingdom's independent nuclear deterrent in helping to maintain world peace. As a result, the United States has for many years helped maintain and modernize that deterrent. This is what we have referred to as the existing pattern of cooperation between the United States and the United Kingdom. It currently includes agreement by the United States to sell the UK the Trident to weapon systems. What we did in that statement was to, was to assert as the policy of the United States government that in the future, any strategic modernization the United Kingdom decided it needed to carry out, we could do. Under this statement, we could have sold the UK MX if, we, if, 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 if it wanted to. But the door was open so that, or, or rather, we, we, we had made a statement saying that strategic modernization between the United States and the United Kingdom was outside the treaty and was not subject to any Soviet oversight. Let me do a little coda to that, because I was the, uh, at that stage, I was a political military counselor in Washington at the end of my time there. I think the agreement was actually signed with the Russians in New York. Was it? Linton? No, start, start one was not. Start, yeah, start one was in Geneva. What date are we in now? 1980, 1990? 19, July 29th, 1991. 1991. Although it was signed later. That, the, state, the statement was That's made July 29th. The actual it signing. Was in force of uh, an agreement that we wouldn't sell to anybody yeah. except for existing patterns of cooperation. The they treaty itself was signed. Saying we didn't, they gave us a statement saying they didn't have any such, Which, and we gave them one that Frank has just read to you. Which I have to say, uh, having worked on the previous negotiations of the non circumvention clause, was exactly the position the United States had always taken. We, the Carter administration may have had its limitations, but we did figure out that we were not going to say we could continue doing what we were doing. That was the point of pattern. The pattern was the established the policy of the modernization. was not what we were doing, but if the British chose to test with 12 Oh, I understand that, too. Counted that as a U.S. test, and all Tridents would have counted as yeah. 12 RBs. It was the number mm -hmm. of warheads you had tested with. And so this was the shelter, whatever the British chose to test. So there you have it. There is, there. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, be before we go to questions, I think there's an interesting institutional observation about this. I mean, my guess is, since a lot of this I didn't remember, some of it I didn't know, this must have seemed like the most incredible inside baseball you've ever heard. This is exactly what people in jobs like this do. That you spend as much time arguing over the R&D recoupment for the Trident or 
Trident II program, as you do over whether to sell the Tridents in the first place. Yeah. Sometimes you get involved by accident because somebody shoots their mouth off. It's also where you're standing in the, yeah. you're sitting in the office when the boss comes out, says, I need to, for somebody to do something for me. It's, it's also worth saying that an awful lot else was happening throughout this period in the nuclear field. I mean, throughout the 70s, uh, when all of this stuff, the uh, Chevalier uh, and the US development of its strategic systems and the UK realizing it really had to get onto the same system. I mean, remember we had during that period the whole question of long-range theater nuclear force modernization, the you know, backfire bomber and the SS-20 needing to be countered eventually after a lot of diplomacy and very good behavior by the United States and Europe together, the counter of you know, Pershing II and, and cruise neutron missiles. Bomb. In the middle of all this, we also had the whole neutron bomb saga. Uh, you know, the, the, the low-yield weapons which, as it were, uh, killed people but left property intact, as it were. It was de described as the capitalist weapon, the perfect weapon. So an awful lot was going on at the same time in other aspects of the nuclear business. This was a very crowded period of nuclear policy. I, mean, I was in London, the nuclear desk officer, dealing with nuclear issues, um, and my job had to be split in two because we were doing all of the long-range theater nuclear force modernization work and the eventual move towards dual track decision at the same time as we were beginning our studies on the successor. Uh, uh, so it was a hugely crowded period of, as it were, nuclear history, the nuclear episode. The other thing that's worth uh, uh, remembering too is that this was a period, certainly at the beginning of the period we were talking about, where the United Kingdom had double digit inflation. Yeah. And we've got so used in the last few years mm. to extremely low long-term levels of interest rates and inflation, that managing a defense budget when you've got double-digit inflation is, not, is, is quite something. Mm. Yeah. So I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, uh, Linton, please. Um, if you uh, have a question, please signal. We have a couple of microphones in the room so we can move a mic in advance to you. Um, so we have about maybe 15 minutes. This is a comment, not a question, but I invite your attention to the fact that every discussion you have heard about was between a U.S. Department of Defense official and a British Ministry of Defense official with occasional excursions to National Security Council and Cabinet Office. And one of the strengths of the fundamental agreement for cooperation between the United States and the United Kingdom is it has been insulated from the foreign policy of the day and from the Foreign Office and Secretary of State of the day. And uh, my first involvement in this shortly before the period was to explain to a very senior State Department official, no, he couldn't come to the 18-month stock take between the two establishments because that's just how it was. It was an interesting discussion. <laughs> Linton makes a very important point there, and the same would be true about the US-UK intelligence relationship, which again managed to insulate itself from some of the ups and downs in transatlantic policy. Mm. I suppose that's the point where I should, I, I should relate an anecdote that I was going to, and I, I, I simply forgot, but as, as, as we had the one or two meetings at the NSC on, on, on this program, uh, and you know, the Pearl-Burt relationship was, was known to be a bit scratchy, shall we say. And at one point, Burt started talking about something, and he said, the State Department feels, and Pearl interrupted, that's the trouble with you people. That you feel with your heart, you don't think with your head. And my staffs ever after suffered if the word feel showed up in any document <laughs> or memo going forward because it got redlined. Oh, that was great. Uh, Steve Winters, consultant. Uh, I, I think now, though, but in retrospect, uh, it's become clear that the Russians completely misinterpreted these developments that you're talking about. So they were looking towards the first strike against Russia during 81 to 83. Well, I mean, they, okay, somebody's shaking his head no. All right, so how could they have so misinterpreted 
what you were doing? Or were you aware of the possibility that they would misinterpret it? I direct you to a book called The Coldest War by Gordon Barras. Uh, Gordon was a, a British official deeply involved in um, working on Russian intelligence matters. Uh, and in fact, he worked closely with Gordievsky, the Russian uh, who was one of the UK's best agents ever in Moscow. And there's a chapter in that book which debunks the notion that Moscow was in a war scare during that period. We had a discussion with Gordon last night in a completely different forum. Um, and we'll, I'll just leave it at that. But, but, but that the, the Washington Post story from a week ago is false in on its facts. And if you actually read that declassified document, you'll find that it um, doesn't stand up to the light of day. What Gordievsky, uh, who eventually became, he was posted to London, and he became the acting resident, in other words, the acting head of the KGB station in London whilst being run by MI6, uh, uh, he revealed that there was this long-term concern, as you say, uh, and he was tasked to count the number of lights burning in the British Ministry of Defense. That would be an indicator of uh, war to come. Uh, he was to infiltrate the British blood transfusion service because we'd stockpile blood if we were thinking of going to war. So they had all these indicators, but actually the indicators were all negative. So it wasn't that they took Abel Archer, uh, the exercise, and that they feared the first strike. That was part of their thinking because uh, war was inevitable between communism and capitalism. So after all, did we? But, I, indeed, but they didn't actually think it was going to happen at that particular moment because the indicators weren't actually going red. Dreiberger, the director of the UK Project on Nuclear Issues. Um, I had a question, Frank. You mentioned the importance of personal relationships, and I think a lot of your anecdotes spoke to the fact that um, really positive personal relationships between the US and UK can have a positive effect on the broader um, relationship in nuclear terms. I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether or not, at this stage, over the decades, the relationship has deepened sufficiently, has had so much experience behind it that actually a really bad set of personal relationships, let's say you have two defense ministers who really loathe each other, would actually not matter that much because we've gone s through so much as a pair of countries um, on this file that um, we're sort of insulated to, to the negative side of, of personal relationships. Well, see, I'll start because you asked me that I think all of my colleagues will have something to say. I think, I think, I think the most important thing about the special relationship, which usually gets lost whenever there's a press story. The special relationship is the interaction of literally thousands upon thousands of Brits and Americans in the fields of, of intelligence, uh, nuclear weapons design and research, uh, 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 for nuclear forensics, uh, nuclear arms control, military operations, particularly submarine operations, the Triton program, uh, intelligence, vast, vast array of people. Um, the most harmful thing to the relationship is if we do not bring up and teach the next generation of the importance of this relationship. Um, the strength of those personal ties helps take the relationship through bad times. You know, and you get the stupid press story that whatever it was, President Obama gave Cameron DVDs that didn't play in the British system. And you know, everybody seizes on that, or the President of the United States says, Germany, our strongest and best friend, or France, our longest ally. You know, the relationship can survive those, that, that kind of buffeting, um, provided it does not become uh, repetitive and, and, and hostile. Um, I think continued direction from the top that this, is a, that this would be a bad thing eventually would unspool things, but, but um, again, the relationship is much more than, 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 than simple headlines. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, all of us will have said that uh, uh, even if at the political level there may be perturbations from time to time about relationships, the strength of the practical working of individuals, uh, thousands, as you say, of individuals uh, in their careers has been one of the most fundamental parts of the glue that's kept 
the uh, cooperation going, probably at its most extreme uh, and perfect example between GCHQ um, and, and the uh, NSA. That's been the strongest uh, of all, where it's almost organic and has been almost organic at, at times. Um, and second to that uh, only would be, would be the nuclear relationship with this sort of general defense relationship also extremely close. I mean, there are those of us who, I mean, and I could talk about my own career, where sometimes I felt closer to American colleagues than I felt to my own colleagues, because we've been working on the same issues for so long, so intensely, and it almost becomes, you know, diffamation professional. You get so close to each other that you sometimes get bored with your capitals telling you something and they don't understand. So, yes, I mean, when I was in Washington between 88 and, and 91, 92, uh, for example, the, the uh, deputy secretary in the State Department was a man called Reginald Bartholomew. And he would time, from time to time call me up from the British Embassy and I'd go down. He walked me up and down his long office. And at one stage, one of his officials said, Sir, do you remember? He's British. He's not one of us. And he says, Oh, get out of it. I want to talk to him about this. So these things, and that, there will be hundreds of examples of the similar, similar thing. I people used to, people I do used worry, however, just, as, just to add, people do worry that this is in danger of weakening. Partly, uh, uh, this is why we have these groups together, one's always hearing about the sort of Pacific drift of the United States, about a more uh, heterogeneous sort of community which won't have the same Atlantic cohesion as before. Usually, uh, the people who say that actually prove not to be uh, accurate, and the whole purpose of these sorts of gatherings is to try to make sure that they are. But, I mean, the trends are not generally that favorable. So, you know, I'm being very honest here. Us old guys really hope that the younger ones will try and keep this spirit alive. Now, on that theme, to answer the question, personal relationships are important. The British are very good at manipulating Americans. Um, and because, but my theory always was that the British have learned that Americans love to be agreed with. <laughs> And if you can give the impression that you've agreed with us, you can get away with almost anything. <laughs> Whereas the French, who take these issues equally seriously, uh, love being an outlier, love being difficult. And they will make every effort to show how independent they are, and how we're trying to do some bad things to them. And it just might be that as a matter of purely independent French decision, about which you had no influence, we might end up doing what you asked us to do. On, on the personal issue, they, they are important. However, I, to answer your question, I think it depends on the proposition that while there are lots of individual issues and individual disputes, there is a very broad and very deep common approach on defense and security issues. And without getting into British politics, if that were challenged, in a fundamental way and on a continuing basis, it's hard to believe that the relationship, I mean, it would be pleasant enough and so on, but it's hard to believe that the relationship would be this close. And on the subject of the closeness of the relationship, for very good reasons, we have not talked about the other piece of it, which is on the actual nuclear, on the warheads themselves. Uh, CSIS did a series of oral history interviews, and Harold Brown, who was a nuclear physicist, um, was asked on some technical point, what was the difference, can you tell us what, it the question was not well phrased, can you tell us the difference between the British approach to nuclear weapon design and the American? And Harold's entire answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, right. I, I agree with Walt, uh, the, in the later, latter part of my career, I dealt with the intelligence relationship. And there, the, there are very deep roots. They go back to 1916 when the American Expeditionary Force turned up in Europe. Uh, and that's when the intelligence relationship actually started. And then the Second World War <coughs> developed. So you've got this long relationship. There's a lot of sentiment. But in the end, it, there's national self-interest. And it's in the mutual interests of the two yeah. countries. And it's not post 9-11, uh, in particular on counterterrorism. That sense of we are facing a common enemy, 
we can work together. Actually, together we are much stronger. I know that all my colleagues, old colleagues, go out of their way. They want to be able to show and demonstrate that they can come up with new ideas, with innovation, make themselves interesting and productive. Uh, so it's not, uh, the, the, the risk of complacency mm. is another way of perhaps expressing some of this, that this is not something that would survive a long period of yeah. complacency, right. or indeed, as Walt says, if the political foundations weren't there. Oh, I mean, there was, a, there was a periods, for example, when, when the wall came down, uh, there were people in the State Department saying, you know, you Brits, it's no longer going to be the way it was because uh, now the axis is going to be, you know, the US and Germany and you need to get on board Europe much more seriously, you Brits, uh, uh, because that special relationship is not going to be so special anymore because uh, with the unification of Germany, the whole thing changes. Uh, I won't tell you exactly who called me into his office and gave me that lecture, but uh, a very senior official in the State Department did so. Actually, it didn't turn out quite like that. But uh, what I said before doesn't mean to say there aren't perturbations in those relationships or that you don't have to work hard for them because, you know, at the end of the day, countries have interests, they don't have friends. And, and Lord Carrington, who was a great transatlanticist, always used to say, you know, the Americans don't love us because of our nice blue eyes. It's because, you know, we're mutually useful. It's just that that mutual interest has tended to be very, very strong through, through the years. And by and large, when we look at the world, we tend to see the world in, this, in a way closer to each other's view than we tend to with other countries. That's so I, to I be guess the, the one, way the one right, why don't we get one or two more questions? Well, I, I do want to make one point, though. And, and, and that is, we have shared interests, so to speak, with, with, with many countries. Our, our, our deepest shared interests are with the UK. Um, within that realm of shared interests, the fact that people like all of us who started working together on these issues as kids and still work them today, even as non-government people, I think speaks volumes to the value of the personal relationships within a set of broad shared national interests. Yeah, let's take one more. Take one more? Okay, we'll take one more and then we need to kind of come to because a Because we kind of we kind of cut him off. Please. Okay, I'm Dr. Willie Curtis from the US Naval Academy. And my question also is, is I'm trying to make a point too because I think it's it's really important uh, that this relationship that you guys developed over those years be at at some point transmitted to the next generation of strategic thinkers. Now, that's one of the areas that I'm most concerned about. However, I'm curious as to how you interpret, because most of you are talking about the period the 70s and the 80s, and you also know that during the 80s there were a lot of peace movements in Great Britain and here at home in the U.S. How did that have any impact upon drawing you guys closer together? Since there were similar types of uh, problems on, on the peace side of, and so forth. You, you mean problems not related to defense? Or do you mean problems no, in the... Well, you know, the peace movement that they had yeah. the air bases and, and, and so forth. Well, the, uh, I... I yeah, yeah. yeah, well, that, that will yeah, hold your <laughs> track decision. Yeah. Yeah, but there was a lot of controversy. I mean, the, there was a lot of controversy about nuclear issues. Now, now everybody has to, Putin is helping on this, but now everybody has to make a sort of effort to be interested in nuclear issues. In, throughout this period, this was, this was the place where the action was. It was in the newspapers all the time. Members of Congress had strong views on, I don't know, throw weight and accuracy, stuff like that. Um, and I think there was a sense in both governments, the British can speak for themselves, but there was a sense in both governments that there was a real debate, but the decisions that the governments had made were the right ones and it was important to defend them. In a democracy, there, on almost any subject, there will almost always be people who don't agree with you. 
and, and I think it's significant, point that I was always interested in making was that during the dual track decision debate, I believe it is the case that every European country in which an election was held, in which this was an issue, the voters chose the party that favored the decision rather than the one that did. I don't maintain it was because of that, but it is a fact that they did. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's right. I, I said earlier on that I regarded Britain as always the most reluctant nuclear power. And I think that's always been the case. I think it's always been tougher for, for, for the British to take these decisions. They've always taken them. But the political context has always been hard. And it's why, in Britain, any new nuclear development has always been described as maintaining the effectiveness of the existing uh, capability, not in any way engaging ourselves in any sort of arms buildup. And management of those issues has indeed been very, very tricky. I mean, I think actually, you know, uh, the Falklands War was, was quite an interesting and helpful diversion in, in helping to sustain, as it were, commitment for the deterrent through that period. But I don't think it's ever been uh, uh, unmanageable, um, notwithstanding the strength of the peace movement. And remember, the British Labour Party almost became unelectable uh, because of its attitude towards things like nuclear weapons and NATO and, and security. I wouldn't like to suggest that the current s situation is going to be a re reproduction of that with Mr. Corbyn uh, and his views on Labour, but we are in a way seeing a throwback to the 1980s attitude of the Labour Party, which became unelectable and only became electable again when Tony Blair took control of it and invented the thing called New Labour. So the politics of this has been difficult to manage in Britain. Uh, and in other parts of Europe, but always was managed. The very interesting thing about the twin track decision uh, and about long range theater nuclear force modernization is that countries who weren't expected to come around and strengthen and be, be, uh, rally around the NATO decision did indeed do so. I mean, when Germany said they didn't feel secure anymore, they then said, of course, we're not quite able to bear the pain of what security means unless it's shared with other countries. A lot of people would have been surprised at that time to find the Belgians, the Dutch, and then the Italians, which were quite critical in all this, coming forward and offering to base uh, long-range nuclear missiles on their soil. So throughout that period, as I say, the, 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 the weight of determination always came down in favor of sustaining. Willie, let, let me just say in a very short statement, which will look like shameless fawning, towards our hosts, the, the Pony Project, as conceived and as successfully uh, executed over the past five, 10 years, 12 years, is designed exactly to do what you said. <coughs> It's been a great discussion. I suspect we could probably continue for a while, but part of my job is to make sure that we give you the chance to get home. Many of you have been with us for two long days. Um, I think it's fitting that the conversation sort of wrapped up both on the point of relationships, uh, personal and between the two countries, wrapped up on the importance of developing a next generation. It's a great charge to the group that will be meeting for the next two days between the US and UK Pony projects. You did make me, and I think you think about something, and you demonstrated it without ever actually saying it through your presentation tonight. I think if we were to ask the next generation, what do they want? What will make them come to become engaged in this type of work? And you say, is it money? And it'll probably say no, right? Is it prestige? And I think they'll say maybe, but no. But if you say, it's the opportunity to do meaningful work, serve a higher purpose, and make a difference. I think they'll come in droves. And the reality is, you four gentlemen have done that, and you've had the privilege, both for yourselves, because it is rewarding, 
and for everyone who benefited to do it not once or twice, but multiple times in a career. That is what is actually going to make the generation t next want to write the next history. That's, that's why we all do this. So thank you very much for sharing that with us, for being here with us this evening, and we uh, look forward to seeing those of you who are with us tomorrow back again. So thank you.